you everybody for coming. I just, our president just arrived. I'm Sandy Smith. I'm the vice president of the Brown Historical Society. I want to thank you all for joining us this evening, which I think for what I know will be an informative program about some place that we see every day in our daily tracing around town and around the area is Annan Flag, which has been such an important part of this community for so many years. And uh, the building is just absolutely magnificent, as you all know. And uh, we really have played a part in the history of our, not only our community, but it's played a part in the history of our country, which I think makes it really, really special. And uh, we break, the weather is in our favor this evening, so I, again, thank you all for being here. I was a little worried when it started raining earlier, but I think this will be really great. I'd like to introduce uh, Dale Coots, who is the marketing director for Annan Flag. We worked together on the uh, presentations and we did some things for the centennial a few years back. So I know that this will be something that we will all enjoy. Again, this is such an integral part of our, our town. I, I, I'm really pleased to be doing this presentation, having this presentation for us all this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandy. And uh, thanks everybody for coming out on this hot, sticky night. At least we're in a nice air conditioned room. Um, a little bit about myself. I, I started working at Adam Flag Makers in uh, 1983, and I uh, started out in the customer service department, and then from there I worked in sales, and then I, I moved into the marketing department, and I became marketing manager in uh, 1999. Uh, so that's my history with Adam. Um, the history of Adam is a little bit more interesting. Um, but I want to talk, give us a little more background about um, the history of the, Ameri the American flag, since this is a historical society. Um, we're going to talk about some things about the American flag. I'm going to show you some pictures. And then I'm going to show a video. Video is 13 minutes. And then I um, will have a question and answer period. And we're going to, then Joe Below is here tonight. He used to be the plant manager at Verona. And he's going to talk a little bit about you know, what happened at Adam after in the aftermath of September 11th. So um, it's a lot to talk about. Did you did you have something to say? Yes. Uh, the reason that you know we used to work at a company, all three of us, in that country, 1954. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's why we came here. So tonight. do you know these ladies, Joe? Have they worked with you? I came in '77. Yeah, and uh, I so yeah, we all three we, we came from Italy and we worked over there. I worked there for five years. Oh wow! That's yeah. why they all wanted to know. Okay, well maybe you can tell us <laughs> something. <stuff. laughs> <laughs> when did they make the George Washington flag? The we worked for the George Washington flag. Wow. For for weeks we worked. Yeah, they uh they ha I heard that they had when they did that they had to. Put it over in the gym in Bloomfield at one point? Yeah. Oh, because wow. it was so big? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because it was so big, we had to put them in the backyard. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, oh, good, because I'm going to ask you some questions. I'm going to ask you later to confirm something that I'm going to say. Um, okay, who in this room has heard of Betsy Ross? Raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> and who in this room has heard of Francis Hopkinson? Okay, I got maybe two people. And uh, Francis Hopkinson is um, the fellow that actually designed the American flag and Betsy Roth took the credit. And she really didn't take the credit, her grandson gave her the credit. Um, when what happened was, uh, there was Francis Hopkinson was a senator from uh, New Jersey. He was a signer of the Declaration of Independence and he was a designer, he did, he did seals and uh, crests and things like that. And he was designed with, uh, charged with coming up with an American flag. So the only thing we know about the first design of the American flag is that he said it should be um, 13 stars on a blue field to represent the 13 original colonies and a uh, constellation of a new nation and red and white stripes and uh, to represent the colonies. And in the early days, people took that to heart, but there was no pattern as to what the stars would go. They were just kind of placed in rows. Sometimes they would be placed in rows. Sometimes they would be scattered on the blue field. Sometimes the 13 stripes were going this way instead of this way. So there was really no rhyme or reason to it. And uh, Betsy Ross was a flag maker at the time. And in those days, flags were only used on ships. 
basically on government buildings. I mean, people didn't put flags in front of their homes. And um, the story goes that um, that T. Ross was approached to to do the stars on the flag, to do the to sew the flags, and she came up with the idea of uh, making the stars five-pointed stars because the heraldic uh, symbol of a star was really a spur. Um, and it had six points. But since she was sewing, she said, well, you know, let's make it five points because it's easier to sew. And she said, let's put them in a circle so that, you know, the colonies are all equal. That it's not, this is, because every colony is like, oh, my star is the first star, my star is the second star, so let's put them all in a circle. So I believe that it was kind of a joint effort. Now, William Canby was a politician um, in the 1870s, and he, kind of went around and started telling the story when he was campaigning and making political speeches that his grandmother, uh, Betsy Ross, designed the first American flag. And that's how come her name got to be in the history books and everybody kind of forgot about Francis Hopkinson. So a lot of, a lot of what happens in life is um, if you have a good publicist. <laughs> and uh, Betsy Ross had a good, good publicist. Betsy Ross, though, had a, did have an interesting life. She was married three times. Her first husband was killed in the Revolution. Her second husband was taken prisoner and, and taken back to England as a prisoner, and unfortunately he died in prison. And her third husband, uh, whose name was Ross, that's who she, she kept the name, was a descendant of Oliver Cromwell. And so she had quite a distinguished career, and she lived to be a very old lady. And from all that we know, she so well up until she was in her 70s. And which, if you do the math, that would put her um, still sewing in the early 1820s, 1820s, which is when Annan started. And we did do a lot of subcontracting. So theoretically, she could have worked for us, too. So uh, one of our salesmen likes to tell his customers that Betsy Ross worked for Annan, but nobody has any proof. And I, I think he just made that up. But when the star, when the flag was first designed, they um, decided that they were going to add a star for every state and a strike for every state. But um, what happened by 1792, when Vermont and Kentucky joined the Union, there were 15 stars and 15 stripes. And Congress said, you know, this country is growing. And if we add a strike and a star every time, every time the um, United States adds a state, then this could get you know, very unwieldy. Can you imagine if they had 50 skinny little stripes on the flag, what that would look like? So they decided to just freeze it at, um, freeze it at uh, 15. So up until, <coughs> no matter how many states were added after that, they just, they just kept it at 15 stars and 15 stripes. And that was the, um, Flag. That's the way the flag looked um, during the War of 1812 when Francis Scott <coughs> saw the flag and wrote, um, wrote the Star Spangled Banner. So here's a picture of the actual Star Spangled Banner. And you can see that the stars were done very precisely. They were just kind of sewn on there. And they weren't all facing the right way. And it, 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 was just kind of, it, it was just done you know, by people by hand. The, this Star Spangled Banner flag was sewn by um, a woman called Mary Pickersgill, who was a flag maker in Baltimore. It was 32 feet by 42 feet. And uh, Mary Pickersgill and her daughter, and another seamstress, and um, two other seamstresses, and then she had a, a, a freed slave working for her. So it was quite a mixed bag of people that worked on the flag, and it was actually sewn on the floor of a brewery in Baltimore because it was so big. Just like you guys had to sew that that flag in the backyard, they had to sew it on the, uh, in the floor of a, of a brewery. Um, in 1818, there was a congressman from New York called Peter Wendell, and he said, you know, this doesn't make sense to, to freeze the flag at 15 stars and 15 stripes because we're not doing any homage to the, to this, to the uh, 13 original colonies, and we're not representing all the states that are now part of our union. So 
they went back and redesigned the concept of the flag, and they said, let's make this, the stripes a permanent 13, seven red and six white. It took me 20 years to learn that. Um, and then every time the United States adds a state, we'll add a star to the star field. 48 when we started. 48 stars? 48 stars. 48. And then, you know, Alaska and uh, the other. What is that now? Well, uh, how many do we have now? 50? 50. Well, there's an interesting story about Alaska and Hawaii when they came in. Because the way the, the, way the rules go when you're talking to making flags and, and the legality of a flag, first of all, any flag is a, that was once an American flag is still an official American flag. So if you want to fly a flag at your house that has 48 stars because it was your father's, or you want to, your house was built in, I don't know, 1818, and you want to fly a 15-star flag, it's all perfectly acceptable. But the way it works with the states coming into the Union is that when a state is added to the Union, no matter when the state's added, it's not until the following July 4th that the new flag becomes official. So when Alaska and Hawaii came in into the Union, um, Alaska came in in January of 1959. So in July of 1959, the official flag was 49 stars. In August of 1959, Hawaii was admitted to the Union. So then the flag makers had a big dilemma. Do we make 49 star flags that people are only going to be able to want for a year? Can we make start making 50 star flags now that nobody wants them? They're not really official. Um, so what happened was we, we made both, but I believe that the way, uh, Joe, I know you weren't there, but the story goes that people yeah. only wanted the 50 star, and we couldn't give the 49 stars away, right? Yeah, but officially they say the 49 star flag <coughs> with Alaska is the shortest, uh, and the shortest life. Right, and the shortest, it was uh, one year. Right. Yeah, and <coughs> no, everybody knew that was gonna be obsolete, so nobody wanted it, except one of our customers, uh, in Bloomfield decided it was going to make a killing and buy them all and sell them, but I don't think it worked out. <laughs> I, I don't think it worked out. So, um, I was, I was kind of, so that was the, the history of the flag. Now, Annan started um, making flags in 1820, and Annan started out as a ship chandlery, which was a, which was a ship supply, uh, ship supply, um, company on the waterfront of New York. And they started out by making flags for the ships and the um, code signal flags and the American flags. So here's some pictures of people sewing code flags and maybe we didn't know our examples around. And here's some other pictures of the people of sewing flags down in the in New York on Fulton Street. And the company was started by um, a gentleman named Bradford Ames in the 1820s. And then uh, in the 1830s, his two young nephews, Edward and Benjamin Annan, came into the company. And um, they incorporated the company in 1847 as Annan Flagman. And eventually, we moved uptown um, to Fifth, uh, Fifth Avenue. And after that, they moved. Uh, they started making uh, flags for the gov U.S. government. They got the commission to make the flags for uh, Victoria and Arthur Great Exhibition to, with uh, Prince Albert did in London, uh, World's Fairs, uh, expeditions, and they grew and grew in popularity. And in the 1860s, Adam got the contract to make the flags for the Union Army for the Civil War. And unfortunately, popularity of flags always goes up during wartime. And so the attack on Fort Sumter in 1861, um, they saw an increase in, in flag sales that was similar to uh, what we saw on September 11th. And it's hard to believe, but um, I have a quote from a newspaper article um, written in 1861, and I'm going to read it. Every city, town, and village suddenly blossomed with banners on forts and ships, from church spires and flagstaffs, from colleges, hotels, storefronts, <coughs> and private balconies, 
from public edifices, everywhere the old flag was flung out, and everywhere it was hailed with enthusiasm. The demand for flags was so great that the manufacturers could not furnish them fast enough, funding was exhausted, and recourse was had to all sorts of substitutes. In New York City, the demand for flags raised the price of funding from $4.75 a piece to $28. Wow. And book muslin used for stars, and usually worth six to 10 cents, was sold for $3 a yard. So this was the first time that the American flag was adopted by people, like you and I, and people just started to put flags up at their homes. Before then, an American flag was only used on government buildings and on ships. Because flags were invented, oh, back you know, in the year 500, 600, when, when trade first began be between European nations, and people were illiterate. Most people, especially the sailors on the ships, couldn't read very well, if, if at all. And the, the ships needed a way to identify themselves, either your friend or your foe. So they came up with different patterns and different symbols and the combinations of stripes. Um, Red, white, and blue were, com were very popular colors because they were relatively easy to get the dyes for. You don't see a lot of green because green is a very difficult color to dye to get it to come out right. Even today, uh, when we have problems with dyeing, it's almost always a problem with the green because it's a very hard color to, to, to get just right. So there have been quotes about the American flag that said the colors stand for liberty and the colors stand for justice, red stands for valor and the blue stands for justice. Those were kind of added on after the fact. Um, the colors were most likely patterned on the colors of the Grand Union flag, which was the, the flag of England. This is what the flag of England looked like when the United States was, a, was an infant nation. So you can see where we got the idea of the red and white stripes. And, but instead of the Union Jack, then we, we made our own. We made our own design. So that's when flags first started getting popular. Then again, there was another boom in the flag industry during World War One, and um, it was during that period that Annan decided to build a plant in Verona. Um, Louis Annan Ames was living in in the Verona Essex, Essex Fells area, and he, you know had the office in New York City, but they said, well, let's build a plant in New Jersey. They, they, it was during World War I, they got special permission from the government. The government didn't want them to build a plant because it was wartime, and, and supplies of, you, know, you weren't supposed to be doing any construction. Everything was supposed to be going to the war effort. But Mr. Ames made the argument that, well, you know, flags are part of the war effort. The ships need flags, and, and you know, they need the bunting. So he got special permission to build a plant. Um, he bought the property from some people who were farmers, and he left the barn standing for three years and let the former owners use it so that you know, he didn't want to take anybody's livelihood away. He built it on uh, Littlefield Avenue because at the time there was a trolley that came up from Newark, and he knew he could get a lot of talented sewers. And the rate that they paid during that time was before, between $14 and $24 an hour. And the average, um, and most of the sewers were women, the average wage for women in the United <coughs> States at that time was only about seven or eight dollars an hour. So he paid a very good wage. Sounds and fair. he um, also made sure that the building was um, sanitary <coughs> and built with all the most modern conveniences at the time. They had water fountains. Now you have to remember, this is, this is 1918. They had water fountains with ice cold water running in the summer. They had fan, ceiling fans and windows open. They had air conditioning. They had ceiling fans and windows open. Um, they had you know restrooms. They had singer sewing machines. And you know and they were still such good quality equipment that was still in, in use today. So this is when Ann and uh, opened the plant and finished the plant in 1919. It was built by a company called Ferguson, who built the plant in record time. And um, later on, afterwards, there's a book up in the front that I had put together for the uh, Verona Centennial a few years ago. And I have pictures of the construction of the Verona plant and pictures of uh, copies of the invoices from the Ferguson Company that you can look at. And Ferguson, the Ferguson Company was so proud of what they did that they actually made a booklet advertising uh, their 
construction company using Annan as an example, and you can see the you can see the pages from that book there. Now, uh, another I mentioned that um, I mentioned about um, Annan making flags for the Civil War, um, and I have a an interesting story here um, about that that how Annan has always been a part of history. Um, one fall afternoon in the closing years of the 19th century, Louis Annan Ames, the grandfather of um, Mr. Randy Beard and Mr. Lee Beard, who you might know as president, former presidents of Annan, um, looked up from behind his large oak desk as an elderly distinguished woman entered his office. One of the founding members of the Daughters of the Confederacy, she was there to place an order for Confederate battle flags to honor the fallen sons of the South who had lost their lives in the Civil War. Always mindful of attention to detail, Mr. Ames inquired of the elegant lady, what shade of red do you require for the flag? As she spoke, she removed the diamond brooch from her dress, and without flinching, she stuck the pin end into her finger, and as the blood came out, she said, where I get to do my southern accent. <laughs> I want you to make the battle flag with the shade of red this exact color in remembrance of the blood that was shed by those who fought in defense of the Confederate nation. And that lady was the widow of Jefferson Davis, who was president of the Southern Confederacy. So Anne was an equal opportunity flag maker. They made flags for the fallen sons of the Confederacy. They made flags for the Union. The only flags that Anna won't make is we won't make Nazi flags, or we won't make Ku Klux Klan flags. We have made Nazi flags, but it has to be like for a movie or something, and we have to see a letter. We still do that to this day. If somebody wants a hate flag, we have to have a letter from a, 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 an official letterhead of a production company that says this flag is being used for a movie, so we have it in our records because you know we don't want to be a part to any of that. And we make flags for lots of lots of other kinds of organizations. And Joe Malone, our former plant manager who's here, has brought some samples of different flags we've made for patriotic organizations. Nowadays, um, and um, has, we don't do a lot in the Verona building right now. We have very minimal sewing going on there. Um, our Roseland, our office is built, we're in an office building where our corporate headquarters is. But we have a plant, all of our plants are still in the United States. We have a big Starfields plant, which is in um, Cobbs Creek, Virginia, where they all they make is Starfields. We have a large plant in South Boston, Virginia, and that is where they make uh, American flags. Also, they make state flags and flags of all the members of the nations of the UN, members of the um, United Nations, the 50 states, Armed Forces flags, custom flags, and then in Coshocton, Ohio, is where we make all the flags that you see in the Walmarts and Target, and the, the decorations that hang on the red, white, and blue fans and decorations and the stick flags. Those are all made in our Coshocton, Ohio facility. And we currently employ over 600 people. Back to the historical section. Um, I have inter some interesting stories about the Pledge of Allegiance, um, which was written in 1892. There was this magazine that was called Youth's Companion. It was a lot like if you've ever had a, a, a son in the Boy Scouts, there was a magazine called Boy's, Boy's Life. Have you seen it? It's about it's for kids, and it tells them about, about how to do tracking and stuff. Well, there's a magazine like that in the 1890s. It was called Youth's Companion. and. Um, they wanted to uh, raise circulation of their magazine. So they came up with an idea, like this is the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus discovering America, <coughs> so they had a promotion in the, with the magazine. And they had a promotion for schools, and they had these, um, schools would get selling the uh, subscriptions to the magazine. And if they sold enough prescriptions, they would get a free flag, which they bought from Annan, and um, you know that would, that was how they would boost circulation. So, so to help this program along, they said, well, we can't just give them a flag. We have to give them a little ceremony to go along with the flag. So they wrote the Pledge of Allegiance. 
and it got more popular and more popular and more popular. Um, and it wasn't um, officially adopted to be uh, for this pledge to be said in schools until 1942. But originally, when it was first written, the the pledge was they changed a few words. The pledge was you go like this: I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It was 1942. You couldn't have kids going around like this. <laughs> they said, okay, move your hand and put it over your heart. And then they said, well, you can't just have, I pledge allegiance to my flag and the nation for which it stands, because what do these little kids you know? This is, this is 1942, and there's a lot of communists out there, and there's Nazis, and we better make sure they know which flag they're pledging to. So they changed it so that it would say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And then in 1954, Eisenhower, who wanted to put God into everything, put God into the Pledge of Allegiance. So he said, Pledge of One Nation Under God. So that was added. And then there was a big controversy a few years ago about whether it should come out or not, but I don't think it ever did. So that's fine. Um, another time, other times flags have been in the, the 19th century was a, a very active patriotic era. And uh, the 20th century was too. And what happened also during World War I um, was that people got patriotic again, and the flags were every place, just like what we saw in our lifetime after 9-11, and it got a little out of hand. <clears throat> the Campbell Soup was, you know, putting pictures of soup cans on the flags, and people were putting flags on, using it to sell all kinds of products, and it was on nap all kinds of stuff. So President Taft said, under President Taft, they came up with the flag code. The flag code of the United States I have copies of it, by the way, on the table, and I'll give, I'll give it to you. You can take it as you're leaving, a copy of the flag code, the abbreviated version of it. But it was designed to teach people how to respect the flag and how to handle the flag properly. This is it. And some of the stuff, is, it's all good stuff. It's, before the flag code was written, when, they, when soldiers or anybody would lower the flag, the flag would just fall on the ground and they'd pick it up put in the ball and put it away till the next, you know, you can't, so the flag code says you shouldn't let the flag touch, touch the ground when you're lowering it from a pole. That doesn't mean that, like, if you have a flag, you can't put it down on the floor for a second. You know, it, it means handle the flag with respect. Don't let it crash to the ground when you're taking it down from a pole. Um, you, people ask about, well, should it always be folded in a triangle? That's just a ceremony that the Air Force developed at, and when they, as a part of a uh, funeral ceremony, it became a tradition, it became a custom. There's nothing wrong with folding a flag into a square shape, as long as you handle it with respect. You're not supposed to write anything on the flag or use it for advertising. You're not supposed to wear it as an article of clothing. Now, I have to say this about that. I understand, I mean, during the Vietnam War, people were putting flags on the butts of their pants and all kinds of disrespectful things. There's a big difference between that and somebody coming out like on September 11th and having a flag on their shirt that says proud to be an American. I mean, if, if somebody wants, if you want to go up to somebody and say, oh, that's a violation of the flag code, it's, it's the intent. A lot of it's about the intent. But the reason they say don't put flags on napkins or tablecloths is because you're going to throw them up and put them in the garbage. So you could have red, white, and blue stripes or bunting or something, but the American flag itself should never be be handled disrespectfully. Now, um, Joe, do you want to talk a little bit about things that happened at, in Baroda at 9-11? Because he was, he was, you know, right there. <coughs> Hi, could you see me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 9-11 was a very traumatic uh, time, obviously, for everyone in the United States. I was meeting my tour that morning of the various departments, and the fourth floor supervisor came running into my office, and he said, a plane crashed into, into the uh, Twin Tower. And I said, wow, I said, when I was a child, for the back a few years, uh, a, a plane crashed into the Empire State Building. Remember? B-25, right? And I said, maybe it's an accident. Well, X amount of time later, he came running in another plane to the Pentagon and so on. We said, oh, now we have a problem. 
with that, the phone started ringing. Headquarters called and said, you heard, you said yes. We went into the conference room, we put on the TV and saw the, the, the damage and the tragedy. We then called, we called all the supervisors together, because uh, Annan had said to us, uh, anybody wants to come, go home, everybody had relatives or friends uh, over there, maybe one of my supervisor's daughters who had just graduated college was over there for a <coughs> job, and uh, thank God she came back okay, you know, I'm But anyway, uh, they said if anyone wants to go home, we'll let them. Uh, we called the supervisors, we had a, a meeting in our, in our big cafeteria, told everybody what had happened, but it was, you know, stunned. We took a moment and I said, let's just say a prayer. And whatever your religion is, whatever it may be, let's say a prayer. And they did. We sent the Pledge of Allegiance to, to the flag, and we sent home the ones. Headquarters had said to us, stay by the phones. While the Verona plant uh, does not take orders, you know, everything is done in Roseland, uh, we were taking orders for a while, and then they called us and said, put a, put a, me a message on the phone, give them our number in Roseland, which we did, and then all the calls went there. But that wasn't the end of it. By the end of the day, two large buses showed up uh, from state police. They said, we're going into the mess, as they called it. They needed some flags. Now, Verona, Verona while we make the flags, US flags at that time, didn't store them, but we always keep an inventory. So we gave them, they had two buses, and we gave them eight US flags, and they put them on the fronts, the sides, and the back. They left. Verona called, rescue squad, needed some flags, gave it to them. Cedar Grove called, they gave rescue squad, again, we gave them flags. Before you know it, you know, uh, the Verona police and, and the fire department were all giving them flags. Uh, it, it, was, it was quite a tragedy. Uh, it happened on 9-11. On By 9-30, our entire sales budget for the year was made by the end of the month. Mm -hmm. That gives you the idea of the volume. And the problem, part of the problem was our inventory is cyclical. We do most of our selling, as you can imagine, in you know the spring. And by August, everything is gone. And everybody shuts down, goes home, and then we come back again in September and we start building up for the next spring. So it happened at a point where our inventories were at their lowest. Absolutely, because that time <clears throat> we would start building, rebuilding inventory and starting close up. We really had a lot. So what happened? 10 hour, 12 hour days, uh, Saturdays and Sundays. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the problem is we had a lot of uh, uh, mamas who had to be home with their children, so they couldn't work the long hours they had to be home for when the kids came home from school. So we reached out and we said, do you have any relatives that know how to sew? Well, being, in fact, we had 38 different nationalities there at one time. Everybody who came to America seemed to know how to sew. <laughs> so, so we had a lot of people come in. We added about 125 people within a two-week period. Uh, we had to check them out, again, the law, make sure they were, they were legal, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, and we wound up with a, a solid workforce. That bump lasted us almost two years of, of additional work and different activity. <coughs> uh, it, was, it was a sad time, uh, but we did what we could. Uh, when, the, uh, when the building was first hit, Carter, our, at that time, he was now our president, Carter Beard, uh, had called and said, he was the vice president of manufacturer at the time. He said, listen, each of our locations is going to do something special. What are you going to do? Let me think about it. Well, it turned out that our plant in Kushaka, Ohio, put out 3,000 little flags. Uh, the other location put out a bunch of flags and so on. He said, what are you doing? So I'm putting up one flag. He said, be out of your mind. One flag? I said, I have something planned. OK, we were making some large US flags. So we made a, a 30 by 50. I'm sorry, you know, 30 by 35 by 50 foot US flag. And we called the on, we called the newspaper, and we said, uh, on such and such, uh, two days later, uh, 6.30 in the morning, be here. And MSNBC was there and everything. What I had them do was make this gigantic flag, and we had it on the roof. Mm -hmm. When they came out, we signaled them, and they unfurled it. And that one big flag covered the entire front. There's a picture over there, if you get a chance to see it. You may have seen it yourself. But with that, the schools sent their children. Uh, you know, for several days, they, they, they would be across the street and take pictures of us. On the day that we brought the, the, the flag down and secured it, it, it was, it was uh, chilling. Traffic stopped up on Fifth Avenue. People were blowing their horn. They were flashing their lights. And it was just a, a, an inspiring moment for all of us. But we made it happen. Uh, the thing that uh, continued at that time is 
everybody wanted American flags. So flags were coming in from overseas. And many of those flags were not to spec. They were not, they were, they were off color, the reds weren't true, the blues were artificial. But everybody was saying, well, it's okay, as long as it's an American flag. Well, some of that has continued, and that's been our competition today. Many of our flags come in the United States overseas. And you'll see on the label, uh, American flag made in China, distributed by such and such American country, company. Mm -hmm. But that isn't the right thing. You realize when we make an American flag, we show respect. A printed flag is printed on a wall until it gets cut and folded. A stone flag, which we are mostly making, is not an American flag until the field is joined with the stripes. The stripes are joined, the field comes on. Once that is, is assembled, the flag never touches the ground. You make sure it never touches the ground in the building. It goes to the table, it gets inspected, it gets folded. It deals that folded in, in, in different, different ways. But that's the respect that we had on, on the Grotto flag. And the Grotto plant uh, has been, you know, uh, it's been a pleasure maintaining that, that building. It's a difficult uh, thing to do uh, for so many years. It's an older building, it requires a lot of maintenance and, 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 uh, and care. Uh, any questions on that? Well, I'm going to show a video, and then I'm, I'm open the floor to questions, so we'll see that. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for helping out. Um, I, I didn't talk about the, the flight of the moon, um, the, the story about NASA. Um, just real quick, and then I'll, I'll play the video. In the, when Apollo um, 11 was getting ready to launch for the moon, NASA wanted the flag to plant on the moon, but they didn't really want to say who they were getting it from because they had such a bad experience with Tang, you know, Tang was with the astronauts drink and they made this big immersion. They said, we're not going to tell anybody where we got the flag. So they went to the three and then the two other flag companies, main flag companies in the United States at the time, and said, we want you guys to each send us a flag and we're not going to tell you whose flag we used. Well, the way we heard the story was, <laughs> And where were we supposed to bring the flag to the place where they were going to sew it to put the stick in it so it would stand out on the moon? Forgot to bring the flag. And so the guy went out, the guy that was doing the sewing sent somebody out to buy a flag, to just go buy a flag, and the guy went and bought one at Sears. And that was our flag because we sold to Sears. <laughs> so it came from Sears, so we knew it was ours. Now, this was corroborated many, many years later, back in the 90s, um, when one of our executives was retiring, he got a phone call from, a, from an elderly gentleman who was about to retire from NASA. Just want to let you know, it was like a deep throat kind of thing. It was an Adam flag that's on the moon. So, so as far as we know, it, it, is, it was an Adam flag on the moon. But it didn't, it's not still there though. It got burnt away when the, when the rockets went up. How do I start this, Sandy? Oops. I have a video, 13 minutes. George? It tells you basically a lot of what I told you in the more entertaining fashion, but I did write the video, so I guess, did you put it in the, oh, oh, I guess it's still got it. Oh, there it is, I thought you were to put it in. Oh, I did. So after you watch this 13 minutes, you have a little questions and answers. ahead of time, but uh, is there anything planned for the, uh, As a the 100th anniversary, anniversary of the uh, Verona building? Not that I know of. Yeah. It's a good question, though. It's all here. Five, six years down the road. Yeah, it is. It is. I didn't even... Okay. Ready? Ready? Yes, sir. In 2007, Annan and Company celebrates its 160th anniversary as a manufacturer of American flags. As part of the commemorative activities surrounding this anniversary, Annan and Company has produced this history of American flag making from the time of Betsy Ross up through the present day.
There are fascinating stories, some historical documents, and a great deal of speculation about how the Stars and Stripes was born. We do not have a final answer today, only a mixture of legend and history intertwined with a romantic family tradition. Prior to the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the United States was using the Continental Colors. This flag is also known as the Grand Union. Once our new country declared their independence from Great Britain on July 4th of 1776, the Continental Colors was rendered obsolete. It wouldn't do to have England's colors as the canton and the standard of this new independent nation. The United States of America needed a flag that was wholly its own. But it was not until a year later that the Continental Colors was officially replaced. The only official historical record of the adoption of the Stars and Stripes is a resolution made by Congress on June 14, 1777 that reads, Resolve that the flag of the United States be 13 stripes, alternate red and white, that the Union be 13 stars, white in a blue field, representing a new constellation. Historians today agree that the design of the first flag was most probably the work of Francis Hopkinson. Mr. Hopkinson was an accomplished gentleman of the period, a noted poet, artist, designer of seals, and as a member of the Continental Congress, was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Betsy Ross, a seamstress in Philadelphia in 1776, has long been credited with sewing our country's first flag. The legend has it that General George Washington, along with Robert Morris and George Ross, both prominent Pennsylvania statesmen, went to the home of Mrs. Betsy Ross, a young Revolutionary War widow, with design in hand to ask her to sew the first stars and stripes. It was said that Mrs. Ross made some suggestions regarding modifications to the flag design, such as arranging the stars in a circle and making them five-pointed stars instead of six-pointed stars. General George Washington supposedly nodded his approval, and Betsy Ross then went on to construct a sample that was presented to Congress and made official. While we will never know how much of the legend is true, the 13-star flag with the five-pointed stars arranged in a circle is known today as the Betsy Ross flag. It is one of the most enduring historical flag designs with thousands being made and sold in the United States to this day. The arrangement of stars in a linear fashion, as well as all kinds of other shapes, such as diamonds, stars, and seemingly haphazard arrangements, persisted well into the 19th century. Most of the flags made in the 18th century were made from linen, derived from the flax plant, silk, and wool bunting. They were sewn by hand, and the dyes were formulated from a variety of natural substances, such as the indigo plant, producing dyes of a rich blue color, and the cochineal insect that is used to make long-lasting red dyes even to this day. Thanks to Eli Whitney and his invention of the cotton gin in 1793, U.S. cotton mills evolved and began to produce cotton textiles and thread. It wasn't until much later, the 1860s, that cotton was made with the weights and finishes suitable for use by the American flag makers. It was not uncommon for seamstresses to make flags at home and sell them to the federal government for use on ships and on government buildings. Betsy Ross, in fact, continued to sew flags for the government until her retirement in 1827. During this same time period, in 1820, Alexander Annan opened a small flag-making shop on the New York City waterfront, where ships bound for the four corners of the world did so under Annan-made flags. In 1847, he founded Annan and Company Flag Makers on Fulton Street. The conflict of the Civil War in 1861 ignited the fires of patriotism in the American populace. Citizens rallied around the American flag as a symbol of national unity as they had never done before. Schools began to fly flags to instill love of country in their young students. Private citizens purchased the stars and stripes for display on their homes. It was during this period that the flag makers experienced their first big boom in demand for American flags. The increase in demand for flags coincided with the American Industrial Revolution in the latter part of the 19th century. 
The sewing machine was invented by Elias Howe in 1846 and became a standard piece of flag making equipment. Other machines were invented specifically to help automate the flag making process, such as mechanized die cutters to stamp out stars. From 1777 to 1912, a period of 135 years, the U.S. flag was officially changed 24 times. The arrangement of the stars in the blue field and the proportions of parts of the flag had never been officially published until President William H. Taft signed an executive order in 1912. Thanks to President William Taft, the U.S. flag specifications were officially standardized. The official proportions of length to width are 1 to 1.9, but most American flags sold commercially and displayed by businesses and homeowners are proportioned 1 to 1 and a half. Demand for U.S. flags boomed again in 1917 with the U.S. involvement in World War I. This surge in business and a robust economy in the Roaring Twenties allowed American flag makers to build modern new factories with the latest equipment. Automated processes and assembly lines became a part of U.S. flag manufacturing. Small stick flags were a very popular item. They were mostly used as grave markers to memorialize the veterans of the Civil War and World War I. The methods of production in the flag-making factories kept pace with 20th century progress. Small American flags are dyed and are stitched along the sides by an automatic hemming machine. It handles multiple rolls in one operation. Up until the mid-1950s, star fields of full-size flags were either dyed or individually constructed. After stars were placed and sewn on one side of the blue field, the operators would sew squares of white material in corresponding positions on the reverse side and then trim the squares into star shapes. In this way, they could line up the stars exactly on both sides. The stars of big flags, 15 by 25 feet and larger, are still made by hand today. Most star fields for smaller U.S. flags are made by automation with Shifley embroidery machines. 20th century flags were made mostly of silk, wool, and cotton until the textile companies introduced the new synthetic fabrics to the industry after the Second World War. Materials such as nylon and polyester were specially formulated to resist tearing and fraying in the wind and to retain their colors better than natural fabrics. Nylon is the most popular fabric for the vast majority of U.S.-based American flag makers. Ananin Company uses a special type of nylon made by the Invista Corporation called Solar Max for its flags. Solar Max nylon is formulated with special UV inhibitors so it resists the damaging effects of the sun's rays. Solar Max is the same strong type of nylon that is used to make parachutes, hot air balloons, life jackets, and inflatable rafts. To make the flag material, nylon fibers are created through a chemical process from natural minerals and then are spun into filaments. These filaments are sent to a textile mill where they are woven into fabric. The fabric is then sent to a conversion plant where it is dyed to the specified colors of Old Glory Red, Old Glory Blue and White and finished with an additional coating. Finally, it arrives at the flag manufacturing factories on large rolls ready to be cut and sewn into flags. A cutting machine called a slitter shears through the rolls and cuts stripes of varying widths. Automatic sewing machines hem the stripes. Operators then cut the stripes into appropriate lengths and join them in groups known as shorts and longs for each size flag. The shorts are groups of four red and three white stripes and are sewn onto the star fields, which have been trimmed and hemmed. The longs, which make up the bottom portion of the flag, have three red and three white stripes, are then added to the flag. Next, the fly hem, the part of the flag that flies, is sewn with a minimum of four rows of reinforced stitching, more for larger or industrial grade flags. The final piece of the flag is the heading or header. Traditionally, headings are made from canvas. The type of canvas used for flags is duck. This means that it is a type of canvas that is tightly woven. Sometimes you may hear the heading referred to as canvas duck or just plain duck. It means the same thing. 
Canvas material is a reference to the type of weave. Canvas can be made from a variety of materials. Cotton and polyester canvas are the types most often used for flag headings. For most flags, brass grommets are inserted into the heading so the flag can be attached to the flagpole with clips or ropes. Some flags are made with a roped heading where the rope is sewn into the heading of the flag, usually for larger flags or for industrial application. Flags made with a pole sleeve are becoming increasingly popular with homeowners because they are so easy to slip on and off the pole. Once a flag is completed, it is carefully inspected and only then is it folded, packaged and readied for inventory. Cellular manufacturing techniques increase efficiencies and improve the quality of the U.S. flags. In cellular manufacturing, each group of operators or cell is responsible for making a quantity of U.S. flags from start to finish instead of passing along a portion of the flag down an assembly line. Annan and Company manufactures not only U.S. flags but also flags of all the 50 states and the 192 United Nations member nations. The Protocol Office of the United Nations must approve all of Annan's international flags prior to production. The United Nations flies Annan's international flags at its headquarters in New York City. Annan and Company also makes custom flags for many organizations and corporations. Digital printing allows detailed images and color matching to be duplicated on flags while maximizing color retention. Computers run by skilled technicians precisely match colors and all color formulas are carefully controlled in Annan's R&D laboratories. American flag making has come a long way since the days of Betsy Ross and Francis Hopkinson, but some things haven't changed. A majority of the U.S. flags sold in the United States are still sewn by American workers, people who take great pride in their role as makers of our country's greatest and most recognizable symbol. To be sure that your American flag was made in the USA, look for the certification seal of the Flag Manufacturers Association of America. This seal is your assurance that this product has been made in the USA of materials that are domestic in origin and that all processes in every step of the U.S. flag's manufacture were completed in USA facilities with USA labor. And I did bring extra copies if anybody wants it, because I think Sandra said that there were some people that couldn't make it tonight and wanted to at least have something of the show. So anybody have any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Can you clarify when you said that, um, can you clarify the hourly rate, rate uh, wage, you said like 7 to $14 an hour, but this was, did you mean a week or, because that sounds really hot. Yeah, you're right, it does. <laughs> it must have been a week. But something I read this morning, it stuck in my mind. Or it might have been a day or a week or something, but whatever it was, it was like higher, much higher than the national average. Okay. I'll have to check that. That just seems Yeah, great. you're right. But well, there's people nowadays that don't make that much money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't, I don't, that, that couldn't have been an hour. It must, I must have been my mind felt for an hour because they're putting this day. That must have been a weekly way. Because you were yeah, talking so. about the early 1900s. Right, that was 1990. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh, is it? Oh, Joe tells me it was it was around eight dollars a week. Yeah, oh, that makes sense. Week. Okay. okay. <laughs> I, it must be me that makes eight dollars an hour. Yes, sir. A few weeks ago, I had some Florida visitors, and we rode our bicycles in the uh, Montclair Parade, Fourth of July Parade, and I wanted to have flags for each each country represented, and I had to go to uh, some uh, outlet. I think there were Edin flags in Clifton. Uh-huh. Were those made in the United States and uh, where were they made? I hope they were made in the United States. Well there were little flags like this. We make those, but there are people that there are we don't sell direct. I mean you can't go to our plant and buy anything. I know I tried have, that. It didn't we don't work. we don't even have anything up here in boxes or anything to sell yet. But uh, so we sell people to Gates Gates flag or Apollo flag to buy the stick flags. Now as far as I know they're still, they buy our stick flags, which are made in our South Boston plant. There are a lot of stick flags that are imported from other countries, so I, unless I look at them, I can't tell you where they came from. But it's interesting that you should bring that up because, as Joe said, 
about make sure you see your American flag is made in the United States. I mean, I'm not saying that it doesn't have to be an anti flag, but please make sure it was made in the United States. And by law, uh, flags are covered, are classed by the um, Federal Trade Commission as textiles. And anytime you buy a textile, whether it's clothing or bed sheets or drapes or tablecloths or anything that's fabric that's over a certain size, you have, it has to have the material content. By percentage, you can't just say like poly cotton, it has to say 70% poly, 30% cotton, or whatever. It has to say the country of origin, and it has to be a name or a number representing the manufacturer. However, the little stick flags, and this is where the imports come in, the little stick flags, because of their small size, are not classed as a textile. They're classed as a novelty item, or a, I don't know, whatever. And they're not subject to be individually labeled as to country of origin. So that's how they get away with it, that veterans groups unknowingly have bought boxes of stick flags to put on graves. And, and it's only when they get the carton that they see the carton says that it's important. It's not on each individual flag. So with the stick flags, sometimes it's very hard to tell. But ours, the ones that we sell at Target, uh, Walmart, and uh, True Value Hardware, we, we have, um, we sell them in little poly bags and, and our name is on them, it says made in the United States on them. And chances are, if you, if you have to hunt on the label for the label that says where it's made, it's probably um, imported because anything that's made in the United States, they put prominently on the label made in the United States because they're proud of it. Yes? Are the flags used uh, by the U.S. Army and other government agencies purchased, are they all made in the United States or are they buying them at the lowest cost? Well, it's interesting you should say that because there's a bill before Congress right now. First of all, Annan, Annan um, when we uh, purchased a, a competitive company back in the late 90s called Detra Flag Company, the acquisition of that company made Annan um, too large a company to be eligible for government bids because government bids are set aside for small businesses and uh, minority-owned businesses. Um, so we, from the late 90s on, we were out of that bidding. We don't we don't bid on them, so I don't get the bid specs anymore. Um, the flags that as far, at that time, the, as far as I know, the flags were only the bids were only going to American manufacturers. <coughs> now. I don't know if that's changed, but there is a law before Congress that says that any flags flown on government buildings um, should be made in the United States. The bill kind of died in the House, passed Congress, and then it just kind of died, right? Yeah. And But I don't know if <coughs> the person that introduced that bill did it for political reasons, because I really don't think it's an issue. I don't think that those bids go to foreign companies. I think they can stay within the United States because if they're set aside for small businesses and minority-owned businesses, they're not going to go to China with them. Joe, you have information? No, they, they can do twice, right? Two deaths, right? Uh, and they just said that uh, with uh, the political dependence of the economies, we will allow, and not, we will not allow others to, to not come into America. That, uh, we disagree with that. that Yeah, so I mean, I think it would be a, a, probably a good rule to have in place because it would help preserve American jobs. Um, but right now, I, I don't think that any of the flags flown on government buildings are coming from foreign sources, even though I, I don't have a way to tell for sure because we're out of that business. Uh, how important is the uh, Verona plant in the Ed and Company's uh, business plan? And what, how long do you think it's going to stay here? I'm um, not at liberty to discuss that, <laughs> but, I, but I, it's not going any place anytime soon. Let's go ahead and put it that way. They're not, they're not planning on like getting rid of it or anything like that. It's going to be part of Adam for a while. Yes, Joe. Uh, the video mentioned uh, uh, Annan's uh, Participation of the United Nations and uh, DLI used to go over there to the UN map library to update, upgrade all the specs of the, of the flag for constantly changing. We have, and, and, and the United and Company has designed many of the nation's flags that are out there right now. The island of Dominica, 
uh, Bangladesh, uh, to say, to, to some Tajikistan, a few of the other emerging from the, the Soviet, the Soviet Union, uh, brought their, uh, their, their people to, to uh, Anand. We had uh, an emir from Kuwait stop in one day, and we had like three, uh, three limousines come in, and they came out and wanted to take a tour of the plant, and they wanted to see how their flag was made, which we, we showed them at that time. Uh, it's, it's been a constant thing. Uh, we had a Japanese trade delegation come into the Verona plant. They had gone to the United Nations and then came to Verona to see the Japanese trade delegation. <coughs> and they always exchange. The Japanese, when they come, will always bring a gift. We got a, a quick call from the United Nations that they were coming. We went and got gifts to, to give them back. We asked them what they could do. They said, take us to the manor for something to eat. They wanted to stay. <laughs> <laughs> We needed, they, they wanted sake. Mana said, we don't have sake. So I went over to the, uh, the Japanese restaurant, I can't think of the name of it now. Down, but yeah. it's, it's closed now, right? Yeah. right. And they said, here's the deal. They said, we can't do that, it's illegal. We said, well, we have a Japanese trade delegation. Delegation. The next thing, they give us a case of sake. <laughs> uh, there were only uh, eight or nine of us, because they said, quick, call your wife and come in, we're going dinner with her. <laughs> I know it was Lee, it was uh, Randy, and, and a few others, and a few others. So when, maybe we were eight to ten. They were our guests, they paid. They were not. They had 20 some more people. They said, no, the numbers don't have us. There's more of us than there are of So, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing of what has passed through that particular building. Mm -hmm. you remember what days you went to I remember we, we went over there, and um, remember the time we went to Hammer and Sickle? And they and it's just, it's the silliest things. The hammer on, on one design, the hammer on the hammer and sickle on the USSR flag was a, had a flat end, and then somebody else's artwork it had a sloped end. And we had all these Russians coming in arguing in Russian over, over whether the hammer should have a flat end or a sort of two of us were standing there waiting for them to make up their minds. <laughs> we had an interesting thing with that Tajikistan development. Uh, while we were there. Uh, there was a little bit of a hubbub. Some gentleman came in who was giving them a hard time display, explaining what the Tajikistan flag looked like. And he had no idea what the flag looked like. And we had mentioned to the security people there, they went over and the man was uh, in some sort of a, a, a prison. <laughs> <laughs> it seems he had planned to, uh, to sabotage some of the. Oh, okay. We received a, a thank you. Yeah, oh, yes, yes, that's right. We received right. a thing from their, their uh, security. I think it's been a thing. It is interesting. The, the countries, the Malawi, the country of Malawi just changed their flag again. The, the, they had, their flag was a rising sun. And then this dictator came in and he made it a full sun because he said, we're not rising anymore, we're already risen. And then, he, he really, and then like uh, about six months ago, they went in and deposed him, got rid of him, got rid of the flag, put the rising sun back. You know, Joe always used to tell me, Dale, the smaller the country, the bigger the flag. <laughs> sure. Sure. The, uh, we went to a number of flag changes. Uh, you know, and they, they accepted many of uh, the suggestions to make a lot of people to do this way. By the way, when they mentioned that the flag was on the road, it was made of Roman flag. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they put a we were dealing with the, uh, the Johnson Space Center at that time, and we felt very strongly that the flag that left the road would have been ours. I have some literature over there that the uh, other one also brought uh, on Anand, uh, Anand's claim to the uh, flag on the moon, and also uh, our flag was on Mount Sur, watching Virginia. Right. You, oh, I just wanted to tell you, when you go over to the table, uh, you're each welcome to take one of these brochures. There's a pile of them and one of these brochures. Um, and, a, and one a flag, a couple of flags if you want. I'll leave them on the table. But the other materials belong to Joe, so, and the book belongs to me. So just please, you can look at them. Just don't. The only thing that, I mean, I just brought it up for everybody. These, <laughs> these two things, so you're welcome to take these. So if you don't have any more questions, I, I guess that's about it. The plants that produce their quotas and, and perfect timing and everything for the government received a commendation called the Excellence Award. 
and they had a special flag made to fly over the different plants that received the oh. support. And it had a big E on it. It was a strange uh, flag that came out, and they came in real sharp. Oh, like just the yeah, we still, they still have that. I yeah, and my that. father was involved with Wright Aeronautical, and they had five plants. They had the um, propeller division plant in Colorado, which was Curtis Wright, but Wright Aeronautical oh, okay. had five plants in Patterson and Woodridge, and they were uh, plants that are now Markel and that sort of thing along the Delaware, the, um, the Safe River. And my father had to pick up the excellent plants, the ones from Annan, to fly over the five plants from the Verona, I believe it was from the Verona. Probably, plant. I'm sure it was, yeah. Because yeah. he was in charge of the, he was a scrap control manager for all five plants, which meant if a machine scrapped, he had, was on call 24 hours a day. And if a machine scrapped more than once, they brought in the FBI for sabotage because wow. they were worried about sabotage. So huh. the minute anything went wrong, they had to check it out. But they received these excellent flags rather early in the war. Now, I'm glad you brought up about World War II because I do have a question for the Historical Society. Many of the pictures I have from the 1940s were taken during an event called the Rona March for Matt. Does anybody know what that is? Huh? No. Well, I do have a. Um, I do have a copy of all the, the photographs, some of which were handed. I, I think the March for Mac was some kind of an event, and I think it was for March for Mac. It must have been Douglas MacArthur. Maybe it was some kind of a. Uh, but there oh, was the a March, March for Mac. Yes, that's when he came and he was in New York, and uh, uh, they were talking about impeaching Truman because he took. Um, MacArthur, it was a huge oh. hullabaloo. Oh, during the war. And, and there was anybody that lived during that time yeah. remembers that. Yeah. I mean, they wanted, they wanted to take uh, Truman out of the White House and put <laughs> MacArthur in. And there were marches in New York and all over the, all so over the country. That, 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 that had have been uh, during the Korean War. Yeah, uh, McCarthy, yeah it was during, during the Korean War. China. Right. He wanted right. to go into China. You know, oh. fight all the way through. And Truman and sacked him. They says they didn't want to get into a war with China. You know, so basically that was the whole thing. And, and, and yeah, he, he, he got sacked rid of him. him. Yeah, he got rid of him. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but there was a huge, huge parade in New York City. That I mean, must have been one of the things. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, just one minute. Every, you have someone here from the Junior oh, Women's Club? Yes. Yeah. Before we go, because. Dale is so kind to bring us those flags, but she's not selling any flags tonight, right? No. And we have to go, no discount coupons either, so we have some. But we have an opportunity to get flags. We have an opportunity, so someone choose to Hi, I'm Christine um, from the Junior Women's Club in Verona. I'm also a Verona resident. Um, we're a nonprofit organization in town. We support Verona organizations, the schools, our seniors, and families in need. This fall, we're very excited. We have a new fundraiser that we're um, launching for Veterans Day. We're going to be selling Annan flags for residents to display on their lawn. If you're a resident, you know that the Women's Club, they do the luminaries during the holidays, those nice lights. And when you drive around town, it's like, oh, look at all the lights. Well, we want to do that for Veterans Day, but with flags. We hope that this will raise awareness um, with veterans and veteran issues. It'll make our town really pretty but also raise money for a local veterans organization. So I have a sheet where um, if you would like to get an order form in October to purchase these flags, we'll be selling them for somewhere in $15 to $20 and you'll get enough flags to decorate your entire lawn. I have a sign up sheet and we'll hand deliver a uh, order form to your house. Um, and again, we really appreciate your support and we're really proud that we get to um, do this for Veterans Day and sell in. And if someone misses it, you're going to have some ads in the paper? We're going to have lots of ads. Okay, because I, I will tell you, the luminaries, my neighbor wasn't sure. We, we shared. <laughs> we, we shared luminaries because the driveways were kind of strange. So you might go home and find out your neighbor is willing to go in with you to do We something. really hope that we can really, for Veterans Day, which is in November, just decorate the entire town in flags and raise some good money in the process. So thank you for allowing me yeah, to make that and, announcement. And the other thing, too, is that this is going to be, we're being filmed this evening, and this is going to be on VTV. So if you have some friends who know that didn't make it tonight, they'll be able to, this is the first time the Historical Society is going to have something on VTV. Okay, which I think is super. Really, really special. Thank you all. Uh, for those who 
are interested in some of the activities that the uh, oh, Historical right. Society is doing, we will have our business meeting following this meeting here. Certainly want to thank the, uh, the folks from Anna to come and do such a wonderful presentation uh, on the history of the company. Your, I guess your former president uh, 20 years ago. And uh, I remember the thing that really struck me about the history of the company is that when the Verona facility was constructed, it was constructed somewhere in the neighborhood of 320 hours? Yeah, it's in the book there. Mm -hmm. And it was built by a company over in Patterson called John W. Ferguson Company. Uh, and it was built, I believe, during one of the coldest winters that we had at that time. They had actually, and I think this was the first time Ferguson had done this, they had built the building, since it was poured concrete, uh, inside a, um, a canvas enclosure that they heated up on the inside. Uh, and inside of a few months, the original portion of the building that's up on Bloomfield Avenue, which is that portion that is towards Montclair, was built. On the site of a couple of old uh, uh, farm buildings, where there was also an apartment. But when Annan first came to Verona, which was at that time, they were actually leasing space in a building that was down on Verona Lake property. I believe it was the old Melzick building. Where you drive into Verona Lake from Bloomfield Avenue, there was a large mill-like building there. And they had operated in there some activities for a short period of time. It was a testing facility. Before they weren't sure if they were going to build a plant here, they wanted to see the environment, the labor situation. And that was a testing facility there ah, okay. when they started there. And that building was taken down when the county had uh, redeveloped Verona own apart. Um, you also, I'm sure, recall the story about how the payroll was stolen uh, back in the, uh, I think it was in the 20s. Uh, it was one of, one of Verona's uh, policemen who was on motorcycle patrol that I believe apprehended the, uh, uh, the person that stole the payroll. So I believe the payroll was delivered on the trolley and it came by way of New York. If I got the story correct. It's been yeah. Many years. Yeah. You so, hear about the story about the payroll. When the payroll you know, was stolen, stolen back in the morning. Yeah, you know, I had, there's so many stories that I just couldn't tell them, but they, they had the, yeah, that was the lot of money back then. Yes. And they uh, they caught him. They caught the guy, they got the money back. Yes, they did. They called the police, they chased him down the motorcycle. The motorcycle chased down the motorcycle. Yeah. 